just before we start as a background thing, that way I won't burn some of the tight 45 minutes we have for lots and lots of slides. Um, anybody recognize this picture? Okay. So for those of you who know that what that is, cool. Anybody that hasn't seen it before want to guess what that is? This is um, this is a documentation of the ultimate in duct tape engineering. Um, this is the Apollo 13 CO2 scrubber, where you literally have a square peg that needed to fit on top of a round hole with duct tape. And engineers got to do that from hundreds of thousands of miles away to save people's lives, uh, which is amazing. I mean, it's like a truly heroic act, and the fact that they got to get this stuff working together and figured it out with the little things that they had on a spacecraft was great. Um, but I like to use it as an example of both a truly heroic act, the kind of engineering we would all be proud to do, and if you get to do something that cool once in a lifetime, it's amazing. Uh, but it's also something to learn from. Anytime you see one of these things, the main thing you should be thinking is my job is to make it so that's never needed. Duct tape engineering is really cool. It's a great skill if you can use it to save the day. But it's mostly something that should be avoided. And whenever you look at the daily things that you do that amount to putting duct tape on things to make the problem go away, just keep that in mind. It's a, it's a useful thing to try to avoid. <coughs> OK, I'm going to start with the actual slide deck. We're going to talk about Java at speed, uh, focusing on modern hardware, what modern hardware seems to be, and, and how we get the most out of it. This will, by definition, be a, an outdated talk in a few years, because modern hardware will not be modern back then. But I will try and focus on some of the cutting edge hardware you could get your hands on today. As a high level agenda, we're going to do some intro motivation, talk about hardware trends and features, talk about some compiler stuff, because to get actual use from this, compilers have to do their job. And we'll start with basics and build up from that. Uh, we'll take a little detour into a micro benchmark example, and hopefully we'll have time for that. Then uh, some more compiler stuff, a little more cool compiler stuff, the kind of things JIT get to do, JITs get to do that is really cool. And then uh, talk a little bit about other problems on modern hardware and modern compilers, like warm up, and then putting it all together, and maybe a little bit of bragging uh, towards the end. I'll try and keep the bragging down until the end, but at the end I will brag. Um, I'm Gil Tenan, the CTO of Azul Systems. We make JVMs. We think they're the best JVMs on earth. Um, I've been working on things like garbage collection for about 14 years, 13 years. Uh, this is documentation of me actually doing that. Um, that. That is a trash compactor in my kitchen. It was broken. Trash compactors are supposed to do minor garbage collections during a week, so the full GC only happens once a week. That's what we do with Java all the time anyway. Here it was broken. The defragmentation function wasn't working right. You can see the fragments falling out the back. I had to fix it. And this was taken in 2004, which is 13 years ago. So I really need new pictures. Um, I've built a lot of stuff, which means I've made a lot of mistakes. A and I learned from some of them. And I try to kind of you know, tell other people about the mistakes. Maybe they'll learn about them too. At Azul, we make JVMs that focus on speed, focus on latency, focusing, focus on consistency. So we, we, we know about it, uh, some about it. And, and I also, you know, as a side subject, like to talk about things like how people measure things and response time and latency. You can find talks of mine probably online about rents on that subject, which this is not. This is about speed. So speed, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. Um, but, but what is it good for? When we say speed, what do we mean? So, you know, are we fast? Are we slow? That's a valid question, but it has to have some context. So, for example, uh, when are we fast? Are we fast at night when nobody's using this or when it's important? Are we fast, for example, when we're rolling out new code, you know, 20 times a day? Are we still fast while that's happening? 
Or maybe we slow down and we do, go dead, dead slow for 15 minutes, then everybody's happy later. Um, what about peak times? Uh, we fast when it really matters, when, when, when it's Black Friday or when a market opens or, you know, when things really matter, when slow and fast are, are, are important, not just on average. <coughs> and, you know, when you actually do something like trading, for example, or, or, or buying something on an online store, are you fast at that point in time? The other question is, are you reliably fast? So fast is really good, but sometimes you can be fast but very unreliable in the results, right? So that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind. Really, really fast could be dangerous. Really, really fast and then completely stalled for a minute is usually not a really good thing. So we'd like speed to look like this. This is how we think of speed. When we say, how fast are you? We'd like to have an answer for that question, but that's not the right question because no reality looks like that. In Java, the reality tends to look like this. Speed is all over the place. You start slow, you go fast, then you go slow, then you go fast, then you go slow, then you go fast. And understanding what this fast-slow transitions are and what they made up of is one of the things we'll try and talk about today. I'll talk about the two or three main things that affect it, and then we'll drive into cool things about speed. So speed in the Java world looks like that because, for example, the code we actually execute goes through an evolution. We start off with slow interpreted code. We're literally interpreting one byte code at a time from the classes and loading them, and it's really slow. Then once that's warm enough, the JVM decides, ooh, maybe I should do something about it, and it compiles it, but not yet fully optimized. It compiles it with profiling code so it could learn what's going on. That's this green zone. It is much faster than interpreted, but not nearly as fast as you could go. And once you figure out what the code actually does, then you throw an actual optimizing JIT compiler at it and make it go fast, and that's that blue code where you hope most of your stuff is actually running. And over time, you'll stabilize where most of your stuff, or hot stuff, will actually be running good blue code. But you don't start there. So what does that mean when you look at the behavior, speed over time, response time over time? Response time over time looks like this. Because we're running this really slow code when we start, we're really slow. Then we start replacing that code with faster code, but not still, still not really, really fast, just better than interpreted. It's not green stuff. And then eventually that blue stuff will dominate and will go fast. Those red spikes in the middle are other things that make us slow, like pausing for garbage collection, pausing for de-optimization, pausing for whatever. Those happen all the time as well. If we look at this as speed rather than response time, it's basically an inverse and it looks like that. You're really slow when you start. That is how slow you are. We're talking about a 30x ratio, not about a, you know, it's nice half x kind of stuff. Then you get faster, but really not really that fast. And then you get to go really, really fast eventually. But you have these drops to an absolute zero speed all the time because you pause. That's the behavior over time for speed in Java applications, almost invariably. So that's just something to keep in mind. We'll get back to the picture. But you know, when we look at the parts and what we can affect, which part of speed we can affect, there are different technologies and different capabilities for each of them. So let's look at what modern servers are. What is it that we're running on? So machines we're running on, this is a mostly Intel servers. I'm talking about the server space. And, and these are the last N generations of Intel server chips. Uh, we're right now right around here. Skylake SP is out. Broadwell is probably has been around for a year and a half. If you're running on a modern machine that was recently bought or you're running on the cloud on AWS or Google or Azure or one of the others, you're probably running on one of those two. And if you're not, you really should move to one of those two. Why, why are you paying for the old hardware? especially in the cloud. And, and what you have there on the right is some interesting stuff beyond just more cores and more cache and that kind of stuff that you can, you can expect. There are new features. New CPUs have had new features come into them over the, dec over the last several generations. And those features can be used for speed, for extreme speed, if they're used right. If the, if the code running on them actually understands the features there and can be used. And, and I'll give you some examples of those. 
When we look at features, vectorization, AVX, AVX2, and AVX512 are really cool vectorization capabilities that evolved over the generations recently. BMI and BMI2 are bit manipulation instructions, including things like scatter and gather and bits that are kind of cool. And HLE and TSX are hardware transactional memory features that have come and now are a commodity. Every new CPU has them on a server. Using those features can give us speed. Beyond the features themselves, the CPUs are just getting better. They were already really, really good, and they just keep getting and better and better. You can see some trends here. How many instructions, out of order instructions, the CPU can keep juggling at the same time without them yet completing is growing. It's also, it's already been very, very impressive, but we keep going up and up. And a CPU these days is not this simple serial thing that's doing an instruction at a time or four of those or eight of those interleaved. It's literally throwing up 200 instructions in the air and catching them when they're done. And, and it's keeping the juggling out, uh, going. It's got, what do we have there? Like uh, 96 or 72 different loads outstanding and 56 different stores outstanding, non-completed, out of order, going to the memory, just to keep the pipes full. And what that means is the mental model of what's going on in the CPU is hard to, to, to project because you may think that this happens before that, but the CPU is going to do anything it can to pick up work and do it out of order just to get the work done. And that's where it's so big as a window that human capacity to order well to it is almost non-existent. Even compilers have a hard time doing it well. Um, and, and, and you need to think in terms of fundamentals of operations rather than how to micro-optimize to a CPU. Here's some nice pictures on how this stuff breaks down from an architecture point of view and some of the evolutions of them. So, for example, this is sort of the, the um, front end of, of, uh, of the data stuff. We've got um, um, things coming in. We've got uh, schedulers going into the different operations and and a cache and, and the rest going on. But we can see an evolution, for example, from a Sandy Bridge, which is a few generations back to a Haswell, where we just have more bandwidth. The width of the buses are bigger, the units, the number of operations to the cache grows. So we get more bandwidth in there. If you look at the actual execution units, so then the helm is the oldest on the top, on the bottom, Sandy Bridge to Haswell. We get more execution units that could do things at the t same time. They're wider. They could do wider operations. CPUs do get better over time. And the caches themselves have looked like this for quite a while, where each core had about 32K of, exactly 32K of data and instruction caches, 256K of L2, and a shared cache across all the cores together in a socket. So the more cores you had, the more cache you had. Uh, below that, Skylake SP, which is the latest generation, you can get that right now, you can run on Google Cloud Engine and run them, um, has changed that model somewhat. The shifts of caches have gone around. Another huge improvement that has happened fairly recently with the Haswell generation is an increase in the TLB cache. The TLB cache is a CPU cache that keeps mappings around. And up to Haswell, the number of non-small page maps were very small in the low tens. But with Haswell and Broadwell and Skylake, we now have thousands of entries to cache two megabyte page mappings, which means that the concurrently cached mappings for virtual memory has, have gone up by multiple orders of magnitude. So finally, we can actually access a large heap and data and not thrash the TLB and miss it at all the time. That's a huge step between Ivy Bridge and Haswell. And it hasn't been talked about a lot, but we can see it in results, especially on large data sets. Looking at topology, just how do these come together? Most of the servers you will end up running on look like this. Two sockets with multiple cores on each and memory controllers on each, interconnected between the two sockets with some high-speed QPI or other kind of interconnect. Each of the sockets has cores and cache on them. If we look at an example of a specific one, you look at the cores, they're sitting in there in the socket on this high-speed ring. The caches are localized to each core, and then a distributed common cache around the ring. That's a nice topology to think of. You can think of a socket has a bunch of cores, shared cache on a ring. Well, that's no longer a valid model, because that used to be good up to a certain number of cores, but we just couldn't, you know, 
fit that many cores in a ring anymore, so now we're looking like this. There are multiple rings on a single socket. To get from one socket to the L3 cache on the same socket, you might be crossing a hop and doing all kinds of other things. In fact, you can configure this today with uh, configurations that say treat this as one symmetric flat socket or with something called cluster on die that says this is like two separate sockets, a NUMA node there, a NUMA node there, half the cache each, but we don't cross this interconnect between them because it's higher latency. You can configure that at the bias level. Should you? Probably not if you, really if you don't really understand it well, but for people who are fine-tuning latency performance, want to get every, every ounce of performance out of it, these are things to keep in mind. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is this is a full socket. It's got all, this, all the cores, but you have options. You can buy eight, eight cores, 12 cores, 14, 16, 18, 24. Sometimes you buy this. You buy one and a half uh, rings. Like, it's not actually that all the cores are built equal. The ones that are built equal are, the one, are, are certain sizes. The ones in the middle often have that kind of happen to them. Now, with Skylake, this picture with the ring also changed dramatically. You can see the previous architectures on the left. Skylake shifted to a mesh architecture on the chip. It's sort of a 2D matrix where, rather than a ring, you kind of go down a matrix of interconnects that look like that. And, and, and that's kind of an interesting uh, level. And you can sort of see uh, what, what a small 10-core thing looks like and a larger 18-core thing looks like down there. These are all stuff you can find from you know, all kinds of articles about microarchitecture for Skylake and Broadwell and things online. So that's a little context on the stuff we're running on. Now let's go a little lower. And if you like machine code, you're going to really enjoy this. If you don't like looking at machine code, take a deep breath. This won't take very long. Okay, promise it won't hurt. Um, I like to look at the actual instructions we ask the CPUs to do and, and play with them and see what's going on because we have all these different CPUs. And a really cool thing about a JIT is it can choose to optimize for the CPU it's actually running on. There wasn't binary code that was shipped beforehand, so it can, JVM, it can run on older hardware, newer, newer, newer hardware, and it can generate different instructions for each. So let's see what actually goes on when we do that. So when I zoom into machine code, I use a feature of Zing that's, that I think is really cool. It's got a built-in profiler. You can basically, if you put your code in hot loops, like here, I've got several benchmarks and loops, I can pop up a web-based screen and see how much time I'm spending in each. I can click on one of those and see the actual machine instructions. It look like that. That's very readable, right? I could go figure out what each instruction does and how that maps to my code. It's kind of hard to do. Here's code. This is Java code. This is an actual loop and a benchmark. You know, we're summing an array, just a simple sum everything in an array. And here's the code that that generates. Now, this in itself is not very readable. I don't try to read that. A really cool reason that I use a profiler to read code is that the profile also tells me where I'm spending time. And you see those percents on the side? That's the code I care about. It's the code that actually takes time. Since the, the little percents on the side tell me I'm executing that code, now I know that's the actual loop. Everything else is crud. I don't really need to read it. It's entering the loop, exiting the loop, dealing with exceptional conditions. That's not important. That's the loop. And what we can see here, this is on a relatively old Westmere processor. Um, with 128-bit vectorized SSC. And what we can see here is that that loop doesn't translate to let's do one integer in a time, but we have these, sorry, we have these um, uh, vectorized instructions that basically say read 128 bits, that's four integers into one register, four integers into another register, that's eight different integers into registers, then do vector adds of those, and loop around, eventually they'll add the vector adds together. So it's a nice vectorization optimization. By the way, most JVMs will do this. Hotspot will do this. Our JVM will do this. This is, that's where it's been around for a long time, right? Simple, that's exactly what vectors are good for, loops on arrays and things like that, right? But if we look at exactly the same thing on newer hardware, here's a Broadwell machine. It's got vector instructions that are twice as wide. 
And here, you know, our JIT compiler, for example, will recognize that this is capable of doing that and generate instructions that are both twice as wide, but even more importantly, there's instructions that load and add in one instruction rather than two separate load and add instructions. So we're getting a lot more integers per iteration of the loop. AVX2 instructions on Broadwell also get to execute two of these per cycle, which is more than before, so we get much faster. So those are nice demonstrations of just simple vectors and what we could do with them. But simple vectors are a little boring because, yeah, how, many, how often do you just sum this stuff in an array? What if you're searching for something? In it? What if you only want to add certain numbers together? What if you stuck an if in your loop? So this is a good example where I'm, I'm running on an array, but I'm only going to add um, the, the even numbers. I test the number. If it's even, then I'll add it. Otherwise, skip it. Now this presents a problem for vectors, because we don't want to add everything. We only want to add stuff selectively and only if it matches. Um, if we look at what a traditional JIT would do with that, we get this code. You can actually see it kind of unrolls the, the logic twice, but it's literally take the integer, test it, skip it if it's not even, do the add, and it does two of those per loop. But there's no vectorization here at all. Why? Because there's an if, right? We can't just blindly go do this. Well, AVX2 in x86 added a really cool capability to vectors. It's a masking capability. And here's what we get with our latest JIT, the Falcon JIT that we have in Zing. This is the same code, but it maps and recognizes it's running on AVX2 capable hardware. And what it actually does is th this, this code has four interleaved striped sets of operations, but there are no branches in here. It loads the data, it then tests all the data in a vector, and then uses the result of that test to mask loads, to mask adds, and to mask stores, so only the cells that actually had a yes in them are actually applied in the vector, because the instructions can now do that. And because the instructions can now do that, we get to run about six times faster in the loop, which is kind of impressive. Now, this is AVX2. You know, that was latest greatest until a few months ago. The latest greatest now is Skylake, which goes to AVX512. It's twice again. It's 512 bits as a vector. That's a lot of ints, right? So it's 64 bytes. It's 16 integers in a single vector instruction. This is what the same code looks like on the latest Skylake SPs on the Google engine. I just did that this morning. This loop performs 64 elements per iteration of the loop. The processor is superscalar and will execute two of those instructions per cycle. Now, the impressive thing about this is I clocked how fast this goes. This specific loop runs at about 16 or 17 billion operations per second on a CPU that's running at 2.3 gigahertz. When I say billion operations, I mean billion adds per second. Now, if you think about what's involved in a single ad, you have to go around the loop. That's an operation, just, you know, well, count. Um, go around the loop. Uh, test, load the integer, test the integer. Decide whether or not to do something about the integer. I'm reading the code there, right? Yeah. And then add that integer to a sum um, and, and store it into the other array. You're looking at a total of something like eight or nine separate logical operations per iteration. And we're running on a CPU that's doing 2.3 gigahertz, but is adding about 17 billion of these per second. It's all because vectors exist, and it's all because the instructions are there, and we're able to match the code to the CPU and say, ah, that new CPU could do even better. So this is giving you a feel for what modern hardware can do. At the end, this comes down to one really simple thing. Take this thing and make it faster, right? So faster code means lift that right side of the thing, right? Go faster. That's most of what better hardware, better optimization, um, all those will give us. So because that's usually the things most people are interested in, I'm going to get into some specific compiler optimizations. And we're done with the machine code. If you're leaving because of the machine code, you can come back. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to start with very simple compiler optimization, sort of the ABCs, and build up from there. You don't need any background for this, really. So let's start with simple compiler tricks. A compiler is allowed to take your code and morph it to something that is logically equivalent, that is semantically doing the same thing. And as long as the same thing, it's allowed to execute it that way. So let's take stupid code. Here's stupid code. What can the compiler do to this? For example, it could change the order of operations. It doesn't have to do them in the order you wrote them as long as you can't perceive the difference. So I can move that, uh, that, that line around. Big deal. I can also take code that has no effect on my result and kill it. That's what called, what's called dead code. So for example, that line does nothing. Whether I run it or not does not affect the result. The compiler figures this out and doesn't do it. You can't measure whether I did it or not, so I don't do it. It's fast, really, really fast to not do it. I can also take values and propagate them across operations rather than do them the way you wrote them. So for example, I can take that and translate it to this code. I don't actually have to create temporary variables, put things in them, put them back. At the end, you don't need them. They're going to get thrown away. I could just do the math. And within that math, I could also simplify the math. See the plus y minus y? So I can just say that's x plus x. That's a very simple people optimization of that code. It, it's not very smart code. A compiler will do that, not this. And virtually all compilers are going to do that for you. Any compiler that you told to try to optimize. So it's, it's not rare to see this kind of stuff. Now, let's look at a few more tricks. Propagation of information, of data, of computations can actually affect flow. So take this example. Here's a piece of code, we have an if. if. If this value is big, we do something. If it's small, we do something else. But we know that the value is 5. The compiler is allowed to take that code and simplify it to this. Because it's 5, the first part of the if won't happen. The second part of the if means bias is 1. We return bias. Well, that means we return 1. We don't actually have to execute any of that stuff. That's propagation of a value that affects whether or not I even do flow and I kill part of the code because of it and propagate optimizations. We can also cache reads. If I read something from a field, from an array, I don't have to read it every time you wrote to read it. I could read it once and use it many times. For example, if I have this code that says read a.x twice, I'm allowed to effectively read a.x once into a temporary and use it multiple times. Now this seems like a simple, okay, I'll get a little bit win for this, but let's take this to, the, to a higher level. Um, what if we have this loop, and you know, that, that read can be cached. You know, I'm running a loop as long as the flag is not set, but I read the flag once and I don't read it again, so what's gonna happen? Even if you set the flag, that's an infinite loop. This is what the word volatile is for. Volatile means do not cache this read. I really mean that you need to read it every time around the loop. Don't do that, right? But without it, you'll get a really fast infinite loop. It does a lot of things per second, but you never get out. Um, writes can be eliminated. So for example, you take these operations and they write into a.x three times. Well, I just have to do the last write. I don't actually have to do all of them because Maybe I could do them so fast you can't see the difference. Here's really fast, you can't see the difference. You can't claim that's wrong, because you're not, I could be so fast you would never see between those instructions. So fast because I never did them. Yeah. So that's a valid optimization. And you could do this um, to a much larger power. Take this operation that says, let's do a million writes. You could throw away the loop. It's not just three operations I can get rid of. I could take a loop away if the next write, I could take the entire loop away and the writes in the loop away if after the loop I write onto it. Again, I could run that loop really, really fast. See how fast I run it? Zero time. So you're not observing the intermediate values. Okay, those are nice, simple things. Now let's look at inlining. Inlining is a very powerful optimization. In fact, inlining is probably the most powerful thing optimizers do not because of the inlining itself, not the removal of the overhead of calling something. It's because when you inline code, you get to apply all these other cool techniques on a wider scope. 
Let's take an example, simple example of inlining. Here's a final method that I now won't change. It's re it returns x, and here I am calling something to get x, a simple getter. Compiler can simply say, I don't need to call a method for this. I'll just access x. Accessors are fast. We don't actually make calls with them. But let's look at how this plays with other things. Here's a similar method to what I had before, but this time I don't know what value is. It's a parameter. So I can't optimize this method and throw away half of it or propagate anything in it because I don't know what's coming in. However, the caller is passing 5. If I inline that method at the call site, I can optimize it to this. If I don't inline it, I actually have to run all that code. Inlining is what makes it possible to optimize away most of the code in the called function. And this goes very deep. You'll see JIT compilers inlining nine deep to get this kind of optimization across a very wide scope. Okay, so those were simple steps. You know, nice, simple. Pretty much all compilers will do these. Nothing special to JITs, actually. I'm going to take a little sidetrack here into microbenchmarking just to ruin your day if you think you can measure this stuff easily. Um, let's look at some simple loops and measure how fast they are. Here's a really simple loop. You know, that's my benchmark is run this thing and I'll time how long it takes. It adds, it, it does, it adds basically, does a plus plus n times, right? However many count times I tell it to do. So it turns out that this code is really, really, really fast. I mean, if I measure how fast this goes, it goes that fast. That is impossibly fast. Now, something is weird here. When you get numbers that are this high, faster by three orders of, by six orders of magnitude than the frequency of the CPU, that probably means it isn't doing any of this code. It's just figured out you don't need to run it. Um, so why is it so fast? Well, not quite sure. Obviously, an optimization happened we don't want to have happen if we want to count how fast we loop. What was that? Right, oh, so nobody uses the sum, right? Okay, so let's fix that. Um, actually, let's, let's do two tries to fix. This is, let's make it more complicated in the loop. I'll add i rather than add one. Maybe that'll help. Turns out that's still impossibly fast, right? And that's because this is provably dead code. To your point, nobody uses the sum. This is a void function. It has no side effects outside the function. I can immediately return. I don't need to run this loop. That's why it's so fast. So how do we fix it? We return some, right? So let's do that. Now we have public long this, and now we're returning some, propagating the thing. So we have to do the math, right? So is that better? Well, it's still impossibly fast. And, and why is that? It turns out the compiler is smart enough to know that if you do that loop, some will be equal to count. It doesn't have to run a loop to figure this out. Right? Great. So let's complicate it and make it harder. Let's make it do some actual math rather than just add one as many times as count. We'll add i and all that. So is that better? Well, it turns out that it is better, as in now you're going to time a loop on previous JIT compilers. Unfortunately, JIT compilers are getting better. For example, our latest Falcon looks at that code and says, that's an arithmetic series. I know how to do that math. And it figures out that it's count times count minus 1 over 2 and doesn't do the loop. Right? And then you can also say, let's make it more complicated in some other way. And you, know, you go run this thing times i instead of plus i. And it turns out that you can propagate the 0 and show that the loop doesn't happen. There's a lot of things that will kill your loops. I'm just trying to show you here. And right now, right now, the code I write to make loops happen looks like this. And it's important to point that it's right now because Somebody's going to read this slide, make an optimizer that say, I know what he's doing. There's only seven or eight possible options for how this goes. We're going to write something that figures out what, you know, what the modulus of count is and what the answer is. Right? So we can always have compilers defeat the code later. They get smarter. In fact, this thing about the arithmetic series, we didn't write that. We use LVM, and some smart guy decided that optimizing arithmetic series ad addition is interesting. I don't know why. I mean, it really, it, the only use of that is to kill benchmarks, right? Um, but, you know, academics do a lot of cool things. We get to inherit them, right? 
Okay, so that was our detour into microbenchmarking. And what are the takeaways? Well, microbenchmarking is hard. You write code, you try to measure how fast something is, you put a loop around it, maybe you're not doing the something. And, and you may not be measuring what you think you're doing. You may be measuring some other side effect, like entering the function and executing it once or something. Um, the trickiness changes over time. What works today may not work tomorrow. I just showed you that, right? And you need to basically sanity check and check everything, everything, suspect everything. Don't believe the numbers. Check to see if they make sense. Vary them. If you do twice the work, it should take twice as long, right? If I double the count and I get the same at the same time, probably something wrong. And if you really want to do this well, then use tools that do it well. JMH is a really cool tool for doing micro benchmarks. So use JMH, use JMH, use JMH. That's your takeaway. But even if you use JMH, you still need to suspect everything. Why? All the benchmarks I just showed you will run with JMH. JMH doesn't help you not have these mistakes. It helps you not have other mistakes. But everything I just showed you was measured with JMH. It's just the optimizer optimized stuff away. OK, let's get back to some compiler tricks. How are we doing on time? We've got a few minutes. Good. Speculative things. JIT compilers in runtimes get to do things you can't do statically. The main thing is you can speculate. You can actually decide to say, I want to believe something is true, and I'll optimize the code assuming it's true, but I can't prove it's true. If it stops being true, I'll throw the code away. But as long as it remains true, I get to run fast code that is incorrect under certain conditions. But since I'm checking the conditions, I can run it. You cannot do that in a static optimization. So let's uh, take examples of that. Simple, untaken path, right? So I've got this method. I get a value coming in. I don't know what the value is. Um, what can I do about that? Well, I can profile this and say, you know, I've been running this a million times, and I've never seen a value greater than 10. I want to believe that it'll never be greater than 10. Let's do this code. Now, I have to validate my assumption in the code in this case, right? But I basically say, if it's greater than 10, just don't run this. Uncommon trap, go run the interpreter instead. But if it's not, then we have an optimization for you. Now, it's a valid question. I could have done an if there and put other optimized code that way, that way. but once you do this combinatorically, the code explodes and gets slow. Uncommon traps are ways of not even thinking about the code, not generating, killing it, assuming it will never happen, and then dealing it with really slow ways if it does happen. Another cool example is implicit null checks. In Java, every access to every field and every array requires the JVM to go do that. When you say get that field from X, it actually means check that foo is not null. And if it's not null, then go do this. Every single place you do that. And if we actually wrote, did that every time, that would be slow. So the JVM wants to believe you don't give it nulls to follow. Wants to believe that. Can't prove it. Sometimes you give us nulls. But what it does is it generates the code as if it's not going to be null. What could happen? Well, it can give us a null, and we're going to take a segv and crash. Well, the JVM intercepts the segv. says, where did it happen? It happened there. I should have had an if there. Let's like, act like I had an if there. That works great. It's really, really powerful as an optimization, but when you do have a null, it's like 100,000 times slower than doing the if. So if you run into that code and see a lot of times where that one throws a null pointer exception, you basically change the code back to the if, throw the old code away, and put this back. It's an example of a speculative adaptive optimization. Class hierarchy analysis is a really strong optimization. And it basically takes this approach. Right now, in the world I can see, classes have this relationship. I can't prove that'll be true in the future. But unless that changes, I can optimize certain things. Here's a concrete example of that. Remember I showed you the inlining on a final method? Well, it's ugly to have to put final on methods just to make them go fast. And you don't have to do that. Here's that same method without final on it. This is an animal. This is how you get a color from an animal. There are dogs and cats and birds, but none of them have overridden this method in the current universe. So if I have that color calling this, and I can prove that there's only one implementer of animal get color, I can inline it. No conditions, no checks, no nothing. When does this stop being true? 
when you load a class that breaks my assumptions. So we'll check every time we load a class whether the assumptions are still true. I don't have to slow the code down. If I load a chameleon, and the chameleon computes the color based on the branch it's sitting on, now I have two implementers. And I have to throw away this optimization and, and run it with the actual virtual ball, potentially. So this, by the way, is why getters and setters are fast in Java. It's why you can write clean, object-oriented code. Without this optimization, you'd have ugly code, or you'd be exposing your fields, or you'd do final getters without overrides, and you can't write chameleons. This lets you write clean, object-oriented code that is really fast. Very powerful. Now, what if I had a chameleon? So I got this chameleon, and now I've got a virtual method. I can't do that thing. But you know what? Yeah, there's a chameleon, and there are dogs and cats, but the code I'm running in is a dog kennel. And for some reason, people have never put a chameleon in the dog kennel. So this loop that I'm running has never seen anything other than a dog. We profile that, we figure it out, and we generate this code. If it's not a dog, I don't know what to do here. Just go run the interpreter. But if it's a dog, boom, optimize the hell out of it, no calls. It's not as fast as I don't even have to check, but it's really, really fast compared to a virtual call. And I get to inline and optimize everything in the method, which I can't do if it's a virtual call. OK, so all these cool things were um, they're cool things, speculative things. There's a whole list of additional speculations. But speculation depends on something very important that the JVM has to be able to do. It's de-optimization. We're optimizing based on assumptions that are not provable. They're observed. We're hoping that they're true. We really hope they're true, but often they won't be. So we have to be able to take the code we generated, throw it away, go back to this other code, slow code, and go again. That's what the optimization is. Without the optimizations, you do not get to do speculations like this. So first, you need to be able to de-optimize. And remember this picture? The reason this is not a smooth yellow to green to blue thing, and we have spikes going in there, is because sometimes our optimizations are wrong. Sometimes we speculate, we find out we're wrong, we have to throw away the code, go back to the yellow or green, and go again. That's where you have these spikes where it, it was blue, but then it went back to green or yellow and back again. Eventually, it'll stabilize. It'll learn, it'll speculate, that was wrong. It'll stabilize and only have the code that survives the speculations for a long time. So de-optimization is another gnarly thing. If you think micro-benchmarking hard, de dealing with warm-up and de-optimization is much, much harder to figure out, especially if you run really, really short benchmarks or really small data sets. So the idea is that you know, often people look at this and say, OK, the de-optimization make me go really slow. How do I warm things up so I won't have the slow code? Let's exercise it. Give it some real stuff and then run the real code, the real node I want. And the problem with that is you often think you're warm, but then the behavior of the world changed. Just the number changed. Just something happened on a packet somewhere or a message, and, and suddenly things are not what you thought it was. They don't have to happen in the first few minutes. They can happen at 3 PM. So many, many potential causes for de-optimization. Um, the reason warm-up doesn't cut it is easy to demonstrate with a concrete real-world motivation. Imagine you're writing a trading system. And it's in Java, because you can write fast and go to market fast. But when you trade, the market opens and everybody rushes in. And, and, and the volatility is high, and that's where most of the cool stuff is happening. And you just started your JVM, and you're running interpreted code, and it's still profiling. So you want to warm it up. You want to. Before you start this, you're going you're gonna to run stuff. We'll say, OK, you know what? I, I don't want to wait for 10,000 operations to happen before I get optimized code. Let's run, prime it with you know, 20,000 traffic things, fake traffic that maybe I recorded yesterday. Exercise the code so it's nice and ready for the first transaction at market open. And it's already warm, already jitted. And it does that. right? So you warm it up. The jits go a while. They speculate. They figure out they're wrong. They do whatever it is. They settle. But what actually happens here? What you're doing is running fake traffic through. You don't actually mean to do 20,000 trades, right, with somebody else's money. 
So usually the fake logic has something in it that says go to the but but it's fake, so don't really send it. What is the JIT compiler going to optimize for? It's going to optimize for not trading. Because it's run 20,000 things and it's never traded. Maybe this never happens. And what happens in the first trade? We de-optimize, go back to the beginning and start collecting stuff from scratch. Right? It looks like this. You warmed it up, you're really, really fast, but boom, market opens, you go slow again. So in reality, this warm up and learning and aggressive optimization happens here, de-optimization happens here, then you re-optimize with the real knowledge. That's kind of the evolution of things, okay? That's warm up, that's the optimization. What can we do about this? Well, one capability we actually built into a JVM is the ability to log and replay optimizations across runs. Record the inputs to optimizations from yesterday, start today with what we learned yesterday, including what not to do. So think of it simply as you tell a JVM to record why and how it compiled things, and tomorrow you tell the JVM to start with that recording. It primes up, it starts everything, JIT compiles everything, you're ready for the first transaction to go fast rather than 10,000 people or purchases or trades going slow before you go fast. And you can actually build a workflow that'll prove to you that nothing that you applied yesterday has not yet been applied. The impact of that is to take that de-optimization and flatten it out, you know, make it happy, but also to take that warm-up time that actually requires you to train things and bring that down to practically nothing because you don't have to run traffic through it, you just need to initialize things. So you get this nice flat operation. What does this mean to this picture? So I already showed you that better jitting raises the bar. This brings it over to the left and flattens it. Right? You, you take away all that warm up curve. So that's better. Now what's left here? What do we have left to do? What's missing? This thing still drops to zero speed every once in a while. And that's that last component. What if we could make it not drop to zero speed every once in a while? And then we get this nice flat speed close to what we actually want to see. And that's where our C4 garbage collector comes in. This is the really proud, proud you know, um, chest beating uh, 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 thing that I get to say. C4 in Zing, JVM you can run any of your Java applications on, basically eliminates GC as a problem. It takes things that look like the thing on the left that glitch all the time and make them look like the thing on the right. They only glitch some of the time. Those glitches are not because of the JVM. There are many other reasons you glitch. We take away the JVM glitch reasons. We also take away all the reason to tune GC. So you might have recognized some of these flags. You might be doing these sometimes. You want to run fast. You want to run without pauses. You want to delay the pauses. So you tune things. And you need to tune things right, right? This application and that application diametrically oppose values for flag X, which means you've tried a lot of things and you figured out how to tune this for your current workload. If you think those are a lot of flags, here are a few more flags. You can choose how to tune any of those. The modern way to tune things with us is this. You give it a big heap and it works. Now that's a waste, so you shrink the heap, and you shrink the heap, and you shrink the heap, and you figure out how small, it, it, how small you can go before it breaks. You triple the heap and you go home. That was GC tuning today, right? Now, in practice, something not trade-like, this is Cassandra running on a normal Broadwell machine, and that's the one millisecond pause level, running under full stress of a benchmark. So if you care about 400 microsecond glitches, yeah, we do glitch. But Linux glitch is bigger than that. Cassandra glitch is bigger than that. Your I.O. glitch is bigger than that. This is the noise. The rest is a signal. So, you know, in practice, we get to do things like this, Cassandra on AWS under an SLA. Simple question is, I need to meet that SLA with that many nodes. How much traffic can I run through it? You run it with hotspot, with G1, with two months of consulting, of tuning and you get the speed. This is an actual real case from an actual customer. You run it with Zing with no tuning, and you get that. Those are real numbers for Cassandra and AWS today on the latest greatest instances. Now this is not because we run the code five times faster. We do run the code about 11% faster. And we start up qu quicker, but it doesn't affect this. 
This is because you can press this thing much harder before the glitches break the SLA. This is about removing glitches. And what that translates into in reality is things like this. If you actually monitor load and timeouts or errors or failed success rates, which is just the, what this orange line is, every time it dips, that's a failure. 100% is the top, 98% at the bottom. You get up to 2% failure in this case. You turn it on to Zing and it runs smooth. You get speed like you want. You get this kind of speed. So that was me bragging at the end. I apologize for that. Hopefully the beginning of it was more educational. If you really want to know more about it, you can come to our booth or come talk to me. But at this point, um, I think we're done on time. I'll be happy to take some Q&A as I wrap up and clear the room for the next uh, speaker. And I'll hang around here as long as you guys want. So feel free to ask questions while I start wrapping up this stuff. Thank you.